What's the point of having a music history YouTube channel if I don't utilize it to capitalize on current events? So all of you people who have heard a ton about Oasis over the past few months and have no idea why people care so much, this one's for you. This is the story of Oasis. If you end up liking this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on more stories like this from music history. In 1983, a young Tony McCarroll went to play with a kind of amateur football team that had a pretty nasty coach, and that coach was really going in on a small kid who was standing next to Tony. Tony didn't like that, so he kind of stood up for the guy next to him. That's how Tony befriended Paul McGuigan, and that's kind of how the basis of Oasis was formed. Tony was born in 1971 in Manchester to Irish immigrant parents. His dad ran a construction business, and his mother raised their three sons. In the summer of 1976, Tony saw the Boys Brigade marching down the street behind a drummer. Tony was so fascinated by the drumming and immediately wanted to learn how to do it, even running up to the drummer and like asking, what is this, and then getting a hit with a stick for doing that. A friend of the family let Tony have their old drum set, so Tony got to just practice and learn how to do it. But all of that hit a snag in 1979 when his dad got a contract in Ireland, so the family had to move back over there to this small community for quite a few months while his dad worked that contract. Tony fell in love with the small town farm life, but his family moved back to Manchester in 1981, and as he was falling more in love with music and football, that's when he met Paul, who is better known as Gwigsy. Gwigs was also born in 1971 in Manchester and was kind of short and stocky, and unlike the other Irish immigrant families, he was Protestant, so he went to a different school than Tony, so that's how they didn't meet until they were on that football team. He's always been a bit more private and reserved than the other guys. He and Tony started hanging out more and more, listening to bands like Joy Division and A Certain Ratio. According to Tony, Gwigs would often hyperfixate on things and follow other people's passions, becoming super obsessed with them. So he started watching Tony practice drums, which is something that Tony had been doing for like seven years at that point, and he became super fascinated by it and the idea of making music. So he just grabbed a bass so he can join in, and at the start, and even through most of Oasis, he claimed that he was never proficient at bass. He said, quote, When I first started, I just played up and down the top string of the bass, end quote. Manchester is a big city, but cities of that size are never quite as big as they seem. Everyone knows everyone, and that's especially true within the more immigrant communities like the Irish immigrant community that Tony and Gwigs were a part of. So that's how Tony and Gwigs were hanging around a local park with a whole bunch of other high schoolers when they met the Gallagher brothers. First, they became friends with Noel and his older brother Paul, and Tony's dad was friends with their dad, so it made sense that they just kind of met and became friends. Noel was always a bit quieter and more reserved than the other people in their little gangs. So that's why it was pretty shocking when his younger brother Liam tagged along, and Liam was the complete opposite of either Noel or Paul. He was super outgoing, super charismatic, and he quickly fit right in and became a part of their group. He kind of became a bigger part of the group than Noel even did, because Liam was younger. He was Tony and Gwigsy's age, so he kind of just fit in better, and he wasn't as reserved. So he's going he's gonna to make a bigger impact impact than Noel is at that age. Tony said, quote, I first met Liam when he was 13 years old. The boy I met that day was as loud and as brash as Liam the man today. His whole ethos is what you see is what you get. Even people who don't like him must recognize the honesty in that. In 1990, Gwigs called up Tony and said that he needed to talk about something. So when Tony went to meet up with Gwigs, Gwigs was with two other guys. One was a guy named Chris Hutton, who Tony knew because Liam had gotten into a fight with him a little bit earlier. And the other guy was a guy named Paul Arthurs, who Tony did not know at all. Gwig said that they had put a band together and they were calling it The Rain and they were seeing if Tony would be interested in joining them. What really sold Tony on the idea was that Paul Arthurs, who is better known as Bonehead, told Tony that they were planning on being the next Stone Roses. In 1989, just a year before, the Stone Roses had put out their debut album and had kind of 
changed Tony's life. They gave a voice to the frustrations of the Manchester youth and created this whole new movement around them. Everyone wanted to be like them. And in 1989, Tony also had a daughter, so he was kind of looking more towards the future and trying to think of things he could do to provide for her and give her a future. Bonehead was born in 1965 in Manchester, and he got the nickname Bonehead because his parents forced him to cut his hair really short. He left school and started working as a plasterer while starting and joining different bands, and apparently he was always something of a musical savant since he was really talented at guitar, keyboards, mouth organs, basically anything playable he could play. Gwigs met him at a, like a student club, and they hit it off immediately, so they formed a band with Chris Hutton. Chris claims that he's the one who gave the band the name The Rain based off of of the constant weather in Manchester. And this version of the band was very different than what Oasis would become. Chris said about that difference between the rain and Oasis that the rain, quote, there was a darker side to it, and I think the lyrics had more meaning, end quote. Rather than have this just be a hobby thing, the rain decided to make a go out of being an actual real band, so they started playing more and more gigs throughout the city. They recorded a few demos and sent them out, but nothing ever came of that. As Tony said, quote, We had the spirit and attitude that was running through the Roses and the Mondays, who were then at their height. Unfortunately, that same spirit and attitude had also mobilized a thousand other young bands, so competition was tough. So they needed an edge, something or someone who would set them apart from all of these other young rock bands. And they didn't realize that that someone had been sitting in the audience for several of their gigs. Liam Gallagher was born in Manchester in 1972. Since he was the youngest of three brothers, Liam had to share a bedroom with Noel. His father was pretty abusive, so his mother managed to take the kids and leave him when Liam was still pretty young, and that relationship never really reconciled as they got older. He was never really into music growing up, that was more of Noel's thing, he was always much more into sports, but then he got into a fight with a kid from a rival school and was hit in the head with a hammer when he was 15. He says that's what changed his attitude towards music and made him want to be in a band. He said, quote, in my head, after that, I started hearing music. It's like when people come out of comas and start speaking Japanese. All of a sudden, I started hearing Like a Virgin by Madonna and thinking it's a great tune, end quote. There's another YouTuber named Mark But Evil who honestly makes way better videos than I do. He made a whole video about this hammer incident, so I'll link that below if you want to learn more information about that. Anyway, The Rain decided to fire Chris Hutton and bring in Liam Gallagher as the singer because Liam had that look and that attitude that they wanted out of a frontman. He had that edge that they thought would set them apart. Bonehead was actually the one who first got the ball rolling. He called up the others and said that Liam was interested in joining, and at first Tony was a little reluctant because he was kind of scared of that attitude and grit that Liam would bring, but then he thought maybe a good rock and roll band needed some of that brashness and that grit and that aggressiveness, so he agreed to let Liam join. Since Gwigs was very conflict avoidant, it fell to Tony to tell Chris that he was out of the band. Chris did not see it coming at all. He said, quote, It was a total surprise. There was never any warning. I just thought the band was doing really well. We were getting some good press and attention. Chris thought that Liam must have bribed the other guys with the promise of Noel eventually joining the band as well, since at that time, Noel had way more musical connections than the rest of them. So it would have been really interesting to have him join the band and maybe connect them with the Stone Roses and other people that Noel knew. Because Chris said that Liam wasn't a better singer than him, so he figured it must have been that, but who really knows? Maybe it was the attitude thing, like the others say. Maybe it just personalities fit better. Either way, Chris is out of the band. Liam's in it. Liam auditioned at Tony's house, and apparently it was a completely useless audition. Bonehead played on an out-of-tune bass while Tony just kind of banged on some bongos while Liam sang some random song. They had already kind of made the decision that Liam would be joining, and they didn't have anyone else, so it was kind of just going through the motions of an audition, Tony said, quote, It had to go down as one of the most unprepared, unprofessional, and useless auditions ever. But then again, we finished with one Liam Gallagher as our frontman. So maybe it was the best, end quote. With Liam came a new name, because Liam always thought The Rain was a stupid name, and they kind of had a completely new sound with Liam in the band, so they figured, why not a new name as well? Liam found the word Oasis on a poster for the Inspiral Carpets that Noel had hanging in his room. I think it was the name of like a concert venue for that tour. So 
they thought that would be a good name, start going by Oasis. Right from the start, Liam also thought that his brother Noel might want to join, so he played the others a demo that Noel had made with a group called Fantasy Chicken and the Amateurs, but the rest of the guys weren't that impressed with it, but they still knew that Noel had some musical connections, so they invited him to come down and audition and watch them and see if it would, like, fit. Noel was born in Manchester in 1967 and was always way more interested in music. He said, My dad had an acoustic guitar at home, and that's how I taught myself to play. I started off copying Joy Division bass lines on one string, then it was two strings, and then I could play a minor chord. That was the first chord of House of the Rising Sun, which became the first song I ever played all the way through. Noel had met the guitarist for Inspiral Carpets at a Stone Roses gig and eventually became part of their road crew, traveling with the carpets for several years as a guitar tech. During that time, he also started writing his own songs. What happened next with Oasis kind of depends on who you ask. If you ask Noel, He'll say that he saw this ragtag group of amateur musicians that his brother was playing around with. He stepped in, he took charge, he brought a bundle of hit songs with him and just set them on the path right away to superstardom. Noel said that he initially was really reluctant to join the group. He said he thought they were decent, but he just really had no interest in it. But Liam kept pestering him to join even as just like a manager or whatever else. But according to Tony, Noel kept pestering Liam about potentially joining the band, even though Noel never once admitted to the rest of the guys that he thought they were actually good. He was still just on Liam, asking him when he could join. And Tony does say that Noel came with some songs written, as Bonehead said, quote, he had loads of stuff written. When he walked in, we were a band making a racket with four tunes. All of a sudden, there were loads of ideas, end quote. But Tony stressed that it wasn't like these songs were immediate hits. It wasn't like Noel joined and then the next week they're getting signed and they're putting out definitely maybe. They still had a lot of growing and a lot of work they needed to do. A huge step came when Oasis went to Liverpool to work with a band called The Real people. The Real People formed in 1986 by brothers Tony and Chris Griffiths. At the time, they had a minor hit song, and Noel met them through his work with the Inspiral Carpets. The Real People owned a studio, and Noel asked if Oasis could come use it for a bit and maybe record a demo, and the Real People agreed. For the next three months, Oasis worked really, really closely with the real people and completely changed the way they did almost everything. They rehearsed differently. The real people taught Noel how to write pop songs differently. They just, they were a completely different band when they left Liverpool than the band that went to Liverpool, and that's largely because of the real people's influence. After playing a few more gigs, they caught the attention of a guy named Alan McGee. Alan was Scottish and had played in a punk band called The Drains and then moved around joining and starting different bands before, in 1983, he quit his job to start Creation Records. After seeing Oasis, Alan told them that they would be bigger than the Beatles, which is something that I think every manager has told every little band since the Beatles broke up. Alan McGee also became a huge influence in Noel's life personally. He became like a mentor for Noel, teaching him how to be more ambitious and to set the groundwork for future superstardom. He kind of instilled in Noel that idea that he could do it. He could be bigger than the Beatles. According to Tony, this is when Noel changed. This is when Noel became the general. He said that Alan gave him a master plan to become the leader of the group to take charge to make everyone else kind of fall in line behind him in order to make him a superstar. He said it was hard to ever see Noel like that kind of more reserved person that he was friends with back when he was a kid, and Noel became way more arrogant as time went on. But Alan also crucially came with some really good connections. Creation Records had racked up quite a bit of debt, so when they were kind of courting Oasis around that same time, they also sold half of the label to Sony. So I've seen some different accounts on whether... Oasis actually signed with Sony Music and just released through Creation, or if they signed with Creation. Depends on who you ask. There's probably legal documents that will tell you, but I don't, I don't want to look into that. Either way, in either late 1993 or early 1994, they went down to London in order to sign their first record deal. Apparently on the way, they got super drunk, so Tony claims that they really had no idea what they were signing. In April of 1994, they released their debut single, Supersonic, and immediately started touring in support of it. And that single hit number 31 in the charts, and it set up their debut album to be a success. 
But Oasis was never without drama, even in these early stages. Liam and Noel never got along, and Tony really hated the new Noel, so there was always arguments behind the scenes. And then the management would play up those arguments in order to get more media attention, so Oasis came out the gate pretty infamous for their infighting and their rock and roll antics. They had a really hard time recording their debut album. They tried recording it with Dave Batchelor, but the energy just wasn't right. It didn't have that same grit as an Oasis live show. Bonehead said, quote, We'd play in this great big room, buzzing to be in the studio, playing like we always played. He'd say, come in and have a listen. We'd be like, that doesn't sound like it sounded in that room. What's that? It was thin, weak, too clean, end quote. So they went to a different studio and re-recorded the entire album, this time trying to recreate a live performance. They would play it live with just soundproofing in between them. And that still didn't work. It was still wrong. So in exasperation, they gave the tapes to a young sound engineer named Owen Morris and told him, do whatever you want with these, try and fix them. Just go crazy, try and do something, not really believing it would work, but Owen took those tapes to Johnny Marr's studio and went to work. And Owen managed to find that spark and that power of an Oasis live performance and communicate that in a record. Definitely Maybe was released in 1994 under Creation Records and was immediately successful on the back of some big singles. It ended up selling 8 million copies and is seen as a foundational cornerstone of the Britpop movement of the 90s and is also my favorite Oasis album. Let me know in the comments what yours is, but should be definitely a Maybe. I'm just kidding. I don't care what your favorite one is. Like whatever you want to like. But despite the success of that album, issues within the band were still pretty tough. After a gig in LA at the Whiskey A Go Go, Noel got so mad that he took the band's money and just left. He said he quit the band, basically. But people in Creation Records managed to track Noel down in Las Vegas and convince him to rejoin the group. Then in Paris in April of 1995, things reached a breaking point. Tony said that years of consecutive digs and insults finally took their toll on him and he snapped at Noel during a sound check. And then Tony said that later after the gig, Noel sent him up alone to play the intro to Supersonic for the start of the encore. And he said as he was sitting there playing, he looked over and saw Noel watching him in the wings and knew that that was essentially his send-off. On April 30th of 1995, Tony was staying at his mother's house and he got a phone call. It was the band's manager letting Tony know that he had been fired. Noel claims that Tony was fired for not being a good enough drummer. He said he didn't think Tony could play the songs on their next album, but Tony resents that and he claims that he was fired for daring to stand up to Noel. Owen Morris said about Tony, quote, Tony was quiet and always polite to me, but seemed out of his depth. So I think Tony did well to survive as long as he did in Oasis. And Noel said, quote, I probably made up my mind knowing that Champagne Supernova was coming up and Don't Look Back in Anger and Wonderwall that he wasn't going to be able to play those songs. It become apparent recording definitely maybe, end quote. Tony, for his part, was really upset that Noel brought his drumming abilities into what he always saw as a personality issue. He said that that hurt his prospects of getting another job post-Oasis and really denigrated his entire life up to that point. Tony said, quote, I will not sit here and pretend to be the most intricate and competent drummer in the world. I never claim to be and I never will. But drumming has been my love. It was my passion. It became my livelihood. It was always, there's Tony, he's a drummer, and I loved it, end quote. I will also say that I don't know that any of the members of Oasis can be seen as the best at their instruments. Like, Liam's not the best singer. It's more about the attitude. I don't it's weird. Who knows what the real reasons were? It's probably a combination of all of the above. Tony ended up suing Oasis and they settled out of court and then he kind of retired to a quiet life in Ireland, going back to his childhood where he spent several months in a small Irish farming community. And then he wrote a book about his time in Oasis. Though he says that he has no ill feelings anymore, that's kind of hard to believe, and I highly doubt he will be at all a part of this new reunion. He did say about the reunion, quote, They haven't reached out yet, and to be honest, I'm not holding my breath. Would I consider being involved? I don't know. At the end of the day, I'm not the only ex-member left behind, so I'll just crack on. End quote. And then he said about their old differences, quote, I've not spoken to Noel in a while, but I'd love to see all of them again. It would be lovely if something nice happened, but I don't expect anything. If it does, then great. Nice ending to it all. Oasis replaced Tony with Alan White, who was the drummer in a band called Star Club, and then carried on right where they left off, releasing the album What's the Story, Morning Glory, which became the fifth best-selling album in British history. Slide, 
The recording for that album was really quick, with Owen saying they recorded maybe a song a day. Bonehead said, quote, It was really quick. I remember really quick sessions, song after song, end quote. With Liam adding, That's because we heard there were a load of pubs in town that were good. So they said that they would get everything done they needed to get done with the recording so they could head off to the pub as early as possible and spend all afternoon there. They'd try and do some stuff when they got back from the pub later that evening, but it never sounded good as you would expect. During the recording of Morning Glory, the media kind of played up the rivalry between Oasis and another really popular Britpop band, Blur. Oasis were seen as the common man, working class rock band, while Blur were positioned as like the artsy Britpop band. What started as just kind of like media and publicity crap eventually spiraled into an actual rivalry with Noel even saying at one point that he hoped the members of Blur got AIDS and died. So... That's not good. They also continued their habit of infighting, and at their recording of MTV Unplugged, Liam wasn't able to sing because he was sick, so Noel was singing, and Liam sat in the crowd and just heckled Noel between songs. That attitude and that drama really added to their mystique within popular culture. What's the story became their magnum opus. Of course, their albums after Morning Glory contained wonderful songs and were hugely popular, but I think if you just ask the average person on the street, they would be most likely to know Oasis from Morning Glory and the songs on that album. It was massive, and it catapulted them to international success, which meant they now had to do that again. For their next album, there was way more pressure. They needed to deliver another hit, or at least they really wanted to. So at the end of 1996, they headed to Abbey Road Studios to start working on their third album. After releasing another number one single, they released Be Here Now in August of 1997. They continued working with Owen Morris on this one, as the same with the first two, and it again broke records, becoming the fastest selling album in British chart history. According to Owen, the band was really, really struggling with drugs and alcohol and fighting during the recording of this album, and they were laser focused on making a hit album and not necessarily on making songs that they enjoyed. Noel said he was a bit lost during this album, drinking far too much and being way too dependent on drugs. He said, quote, I was so engrossed in what Oasis had become. I couldn't think outside of those parameters, just going in ever-decreasing circles of stadium rock. Noel later said about that album, quote, It's the sound of a bunch of guys on coke in the studio not caring. There's no bass to it at all. I don't know what happened to that, end quote. But Liam said, quote, At that time, we thought it was great, and I still think it's great. It just wasn't morning glory. End quote. Even though it was another major commercial success, critics have been a little bit tougher on it as the years have gone by. In early 1999, amidst a lot of media scrutiny, because, of course, the band went into the studio to start working on another album. But then everything got shaken up in August of 1999 when Bonehead announced that he was leaving the band. At the time, they said it was amicable and Bonehead left to focus on his own projects and his family. But in the years since, Noel has said that it was less than amicable, and Bonehead left because he kept violating the no-drinking policy that Noel instituted in order to make sure that Liam could perform well during the recording sessions. Bonehead talked about how for recording this album, they rented a chateau in France, and it should have been like the happiest time in the world. You're at this fancy place working on music with friends, and it should have been this great experience, but there was so much tension and anxiety and angst within the group that it just was a really dark time. In order to be able to sing well, Liam was trying to stop drinking, other members were trying to give up drugs, but Bonehead wasn't interested in stopping drinking, so he just kind of ignored that rule that Noel instituted, where the rest of the guys were like, well, if Liam can't drink, we'll not drink as well in solidarity to that. Bonehead was like, no, I'm an adult, I'm gonna drink. So Noel decided to confront Bonehead about that, and it led to this argument where Bonehead said, that's it, I'm leaving, and then Noel said, I'll call you a taxi. That was it. I haven't seen him since. Bonehead said, I left that session, I didn't leave the band on that day, but I got home and I spent a couple of months seriously thinking, it's not a small thing to do, leave that band. In my case, it was like, I want to write songs, I want to write music, I want to write lyrics, I want to record my stuff. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I suppose makes someone leave a band like Oasis. Not long after Bonehead left, actually like two weeks later, it was announced that the other founding member, Gwigs, had also left the band. Sounds like Gwigs was just tired of the grind of recording and touring over and over and over again. He said, quote, you join a band to escape the nine to five and then you get so big, suddenly you're in a nine to five. Noel at the time said, we're no good at goodbyes anyway, but it would have been better face to face. We spoke to him on the phone. He's been a mate for 15 years. Yeah, we're shocked. 
And that's referencing the fact that Gwigs quit the band via fax. And with the two last founding members of the Reign leaving Oasis, there was understandably a lot of speculation amongst the media and fans that this could be the end of Oasis. But Noel assured everyone that they were continuing on, they had a plan, they were moving forward. They replaced Bonehead with Colin Archer from the band Heavy Stereo, but they spent a little bit longer trying to find a bassist. Eventually, they hired not a bassist. They brought in Andy Bell, who played guitar for Ride in Hurricane Number no. 1, and had actually never played bass. Noel said, quote, I was amazed that Andy was up for actually playing the bass, you know, because he's such a good guitarist, end quote. Once Creation Records folded, Oasis started their own label called Big Brother, which released their next album in 2000 called Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. It was the first album not produced by Owen Morris and not on Creation Records, so it kind of signaled a different era of Oasis. It was way more psychedelic and experimental than their previous albums, less of the anthemic rock songs that they were known for. Since it was Oasis, it was a commercial success, but it got pretty mediocre critical reviews. Noel said that that was one of the hardest albums to create because, quote, I had to sit down for the first time in five years with no songs and create something. I got bogged down trying to reinvent something that didn't need reinventing. In 2001, while starting work on a new album, Oasis continued to tour the world pretty extensively. They released their next number one album, Heathen Chemistry, in 2002. It was another massive commercial success, even though it was leaked on the internet before it was released, but a pretty mediocre critical showing. And then after that, Alan White, the drummer who replaced Tony, left the group, and then he was replaced by Zach Starkey, who is the son of Ringo Starr. Even though Zach was never brought in as a full member, he was just kind of like a session musician on the albums, and then he would tour with them as well. They finally recorded their next album, Don't Believe the Truth, in Los Angeles and released it in 2005, but by this time, the band was really hanging on by strings. That album was really well received though, with many critics saying it was the best thing they'd done in a long time. They tried to capitalize on that refound attention with their seventh studio album, Dig Out Your Soul, in 2008, which was once again recorded at Abbey Road Studios, and it was again really well received, with critics saying it could stand alongside Morning Glory in the band's discography. But instead of pressing on with this new refound attention and love, the band broke up in 2009. Before we talk, pretty briefly about that breakup and what happened post-breakup, I figured I'd give you some of my favorite Noel and Liam anecdotes since that's kind of a large draw for many people when you're talking about this band. Noel once, when asked which of the two of them he'd rather be more famous, said Liam because then he'd be more likely to get shot. Liam claims that a lot of their animosity comes from when they used to share a bedroom as kids, and once Liam got super drunk and he came home and peed all over Noel's fancy new amplifier. During the show at the Whiskey that went so poorly that Noel quit the band afterwards, Liam changed the words and live forever to maybe I don't really want to know why you pick your nose, and then hit Noel over the head with a tambourine. In an interview with NME in 2002, someone told Noel about Liam getting into a fight with police that didn't go well for Liam. Noel's only response was, all I'm bothered about is that he can still sing. And then probably my favorite was when Noel called Liam the angriest man in the world. He said he was like a man with a fork in a world full of soup, which led to Liam posting a video on Twitter where he was eating soup with a fork. But anyway, back to 2009 and the breakup. Things had finally reached a breaking point with Noel and Liam's relationship, and Noel quit the band before a show in Paris again, ironically, before like a festival. Noel said, People will write and say what they like, but I simply could not go on working with Liam a day longer. Liam resented that Noel blamed the split on him. He said, quote, That was my behavior since day one. That's what made Oasis what it was. I wasn't any different, but all of a sudden he's turned into Ron and Keating going, We can't have that behavior. Noel later said that they had to cancel a gig because Liam was too hungover to perform, which led Liam to sue Noel because Liam had laryngitis and he said that Noel knew that. After Noel quit, Liam and the other guys carried on for a bit as a band called BDI, but then that band also ran its course and broke up. Liam had always resisted starting a solo career, saying that he belonged in a band, but he eventually caved and started his solo career in 2017. Liam said that it was really hard to get back on track after Noel quit because Noel took all of the band's structure with him. He said, I was sitting at home with no management, no office, and no one to really speak to, while Noel was still walking into his big management office, having everyone running around after him, getting smart and dissing people. Noel has, of course, gone on to a pretty big 
solo success. Noel and Liam continued to have a really public feud, taking shots at each other in the media and on social media. They hadn't really spoken in 15 years, so people were starting to lose hope in there ever being an actual Oasis reunion, let alone Liam and Noel even getting along for more than five minutes at a time. Until earlier this year in 2024, they announced that they were getting back together for some shows and potentially a new album. And... I guess we'll see what happens next. So that's the story of Oasis, at least up until this point. Let me know if you're excited about the reunion, what you're most interested in. Let me know your favorite Noel or Liam one-liners in the comments below. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe so you don't miss out on more stories like this from music history.